Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Minecraft summary from what we did on the stream, which was days ago. So between then and now, people have been online, done a few things, but the major achievement I would have to say of last week's stream is Mike's efforts in building da -da 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 -da, a nuclear reactor. Look at this thing. This is a multi-block structure. In there are many things whose arrangement is highly important. <laughs> um, on the stream, he did explain some of this, and you can go and have a look at how these things work by Googling it, basically. You look at a nuclear craft reactor, which is actually a very old mod. And again, it's a very old mod pack, so it's probably about the right age of this uh, version of Minecraft. Anyway, you have to arrange all the things in the nuclear reactor. Some of it is reactor casings, as you can see on the outside. Uh, some of it, a lot of the stuff in there is basically coolant. Uh, I think those things you can see through there are vents. These are some sort of coolant blocks, and the coolant blocks, some of them are extremely efficient, but placement of them within the thing is fixed. So you, they only work if they're next to other types of coolant blocks and things like that. So it's a little bit of a sort of a geometrical, mathematical game to get all these things in the right places so that your reactor can output as much actual power as it can without exploding. So in there also, there's some things that actually use up the fuel, and the fuel is in here. So here's some depleted U-235 fuel. Uh, it stored as much energy as it basically possibly can. Now, these reactors work best if they're on permanently because they have to get up to heat in order to output efficiently. And if they are too low in heat or if they're heating up, they're going to use up the fuel to go into heat rather than into energy, uh, which is a problem because you want the fuel to go into energy. And there's a bit of fuel available here. So it's not like... It's the end of the world, but I'm expecting this is quite expensive. Uh, it's uranium, uranium, something else. Um, uh, I don't actually know if these are expensive, expensive or not. Uh, I'm guessing that these things are simply rare. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know how much of this we've got. Uranium-238 or uranium-238 oxide. And the uh, 235 only comes in oxide. So you have to make these fuel chips and they go in there and produce a lot of power and that powers our whole base. I, between streams I replaced some of these old um, blood stuff. A lot of these were lead. Not a lot of these specific ones but here and there there were lead ones and I replaced them with hardened ones because what kept happening was the power went out. And it turns out that basically we've been relying on solar panel this whole time. Solar power this whole time. Which is, well first of all it doesn't work at night. <laughs> and secondly it's not that efficient in terms of the space that you use and the materials that go into it. So Tristan's turned the beacon off, which was basically just given as a spood, spood beast. A spood beast if you were nearby it. Um, you could turn it on again. But that is sufficient not to drain the system overnight so that the ME system can stay on, which is going to be important because ultimately the ME system is probably what's going to be feeding that reactor and pulling out the, you know, the dead stuff. The, uh, the depleted uranium cells. I'm looking forward to having a lot of power to play with at some point because um, let me show you what I've been doing. So, between streams, this is on stream, between streams I rearranged a lot of this stuff. So everything here now is on a P2P network. And you can see I've put another controller in here. This trick of putting a controller on a P2P network has turned out really good. Because, as you remember perhaps, in order to connect P2P um, tunnel, this device, to any network, it has to go through this eight channel cable, either the glass cable or the smart cable, they're eight channel cables, because you can't plug a 32 channel cable onto the back of one of these. Look how thin that little square is there that is highlighted by the mouse. That has to connect to the network that's going to carry the P2P, which means if you don't have a controller, this is what we learned in R for Sciencing, if you don't have a controller, you can still connect things to the network, but every single thing on the network uses that single channel on the whole network, which means you can have a maximum of eight P2P endpoints on a network, because even though you can have a, a dense trunk, every single one of these eight channel cables will be flooded by the other seven thingies. But if you put a controller on it, it only uses the channel that is actually going between that device and the controller. So now, you can have sending down here, look, we've got five of 32 channels. This was full, by the way, not this specific one, but when this was plugged directly into the ME controller up there, the, the point at which it plugged in was completely full. It was all 32 channels were in use. And they are now, and that's because 
I've replaced the places where the devices were plugged in with P2P. So the actual trunk is only using one channel per P2P thing, but that P2P network has exactly the same things going in and out of it as it had before I replaced it. So I'll show you. Um, this one's separate. This one's plugged directly in, so don't worry about that side. Down here, we had three things plugged in. It was plugged in directly to the trunk. Now it's plugged into the P2P connector, which outputs there. That to that does not seem like a distance worthwhile. Honestly, I could probably have plugged that cable into that purple cable there. But that seems like a logistical nightmare when you can just use the P2P. Now everything's on P2P. So all of these have got a purple didn't put a purple cable there, I meant to. So all of these um, P2P outputs have got a purple cable just to tell you that they're going through that. So over here we had how many? Two going into there. Just use one channel. Okay. Uh, so this bank of <laughs> infinite crafters, you have to have one channel per carpenter because each carpenter can only handle one recipe, which means it can only handle one um, it means that it requires an entire interface to do it, which is a bit of a bother, if I say so. Um, so this is using eight, this was using five, and this is using three. So we have got a little bit more room for some of these um, slightly more obscure. Well, this super glue appears to be the thing that carpenters use most of. Um, and I put this was already using one as well. So the wireless access point is down here. Um, it was plugged into here, but that broke everything because obviously that is now a P2P network. Uh, so all of these going into a purple and all of those over there going into a purple. So you can't actually add anything else to a purple network. But I've also added a gray one here, a cyan one here. And we can add a couple more. You know, you could probably add one there, one there. You can add one there, one there. You know, we can move some of these cables around to make sure that we can have a good 32. Well, if we're not careful, there'll be a limit of eight over here. But we can have a good 32 outputs of P2P. All over the place. We can have way more stuff down here now that I've done that. What I was trying to do on stream, uh, give me while I fix this. Okay. Um, there were carpenters there, they weren't doing anything and I needed them, so I moved them. Uh, on stream, I tried to dig out down here. I kept lagging out, so I ended up not doing that. Can't remember what I did do. Just instead. When I came back off stream and did all the P2P stuff, I finished this off. And I did some of this on the uh, stream as well because. It, so the lag went away a little bit at the end of it. I've dug out. Ooh. Well, that's. <laughs> I'll fix it. I don't like the fact that there's an extra. I've dug out this chamber. There was a lot of baddies and stuff down here. It was really annoying. And these hobbed stone. I think they keep growing back, actually. I'm sure I deleted them. Anyway. There's some sort of spidery nature to this down here place. I'm not a fan of, but this is going to be a place where we're going to put some crafting trees. Now, you'll notice that here is the other um, cyan cable. Honestly, I probably should have made that. Who cares? Um, this is connected to the other cyan cable, but nothing's in use yet. This is intended to carry a full 32. All 32 on this are going to be used by this. And what you do is there's an arrangement of uh, interfaces and assembly boxy things that you can. Put down which makes the best use of all 32 channels based on some picture that i will at some point put on i'll overlay the video with the picture so that you can sort of get an idea of how it works in as much as you can get an idea of how it works because i'm sure i understand it myself um but i'll show you uh towards the end of the video i'm going to build it at least some of it here while i record and you can see what it looks like but before we do that let's go and see what uh, other people have been up to give me one second while i pause and figure that out one important thing that we didn't manage to get done last time, which Lawrence has managed to do this time, is to uh, automate terra steel. Now, terra steel is made in a difficult way. Uh, terra steel? Yeah. So, in order to make terra steel, apart from by making it out of stuff that's already terra steel, you have to. <laughs> How'd you make this stuff? I was ready, and now I'm not ready. But I actually thought that it would be... Anyway, to make terra steel, maybe you have to make the nuggets or something, you have to go through quite an involved process, which involves a lot of mana. Uh, and it involves dropping stuff on other stuff. So I think this is the area here. So you're picking up 
Okay, that's automating these things, which is decent because, of course, this is presumably outputting. Yeah, so here's, here's this wasn't available last week either. This uh, is something we've seen before, but it's another good example of using uh, processing recipes to do AE2 automation. This interface has been taught that it can do all those things. In there, there's the uh, C as a cable facade, so there's a cable in there. That's connected to the system. So this is all that it can do those. And all it needs to do is put the stuff in there, and this precision dropper will chuck it into there. Now, this needs to be followed mana for that to work. So that's enough for this to, well, that'll convert it, and then this will pick it up. And then this is presumably, yeah, there's a facade down there. So this will be also having its stuff imported constantly. So that's one very simple way of automating, um, you know, some Britannia stuff with AE2. This is doing basically the same thing with runes. I'm guessing perhaps you have to still whack it in an automated way. So this is semi-automated. Uh, but you can see it's the same idea. It puts the things required for the uh, pattern into this thingy, which chucks them onto there. You come along and whack it with a... And there is. Oh, that's just putting minor in it. So you hit it with your living wood, staff with your wand of the forest, and then Butter boom, job done, Bob's your uncle, and you get a thing. So it's not doing that bit automatically yet, but I think it could do. And then over here, this will be the terrace steel. Terrestrial agglomeration plate, that's right. This was the awkward bit to make. So terrace steel is made of a mana diamond, a mana steel ingot, and a mana pearl, which all get dropped onto here, apparently. And I'm guessing that is just automatic. Uh, Lawrence's only note is beware of how much mana you've got. Uh, so I'm not sure how that gets full of mana, but careful. Oh, there's a, look, see that spark? So the spark accepts mana from elsewhere. It's a way of drawing it and sort of spreading it from A to B. I think it has to be on top of a mana pool initially, and then the spark can draw it from a mana pool that it's connected to by doing that. Um, so that's going to dump the stuff on there, and it takes a while, apparently, and also a lot of mana. It takes a while. Um, again, it's just a matter of dropping stuff on something and waiting. So that's pretty cool. If, uh, if Put this into craftable mode. Make a craft. So that's going to do. Oh, we've already got those. So yeah, look, that's dragging all the mana from there. It's cool uh, effects, by the way. Doing a little dance, and then over here, this thing is picking stuff up. So there was a bit of an issue that Lawrence was finding where some of the things these are all in different places because some of the things required to do the mana steel would be because this one here. When you've made it, it picks up the mana pearl and puts it into the system, right? If you put that too close to this, then when this drops the mana pearl on there, that picks it up, puts it back in the system, and you never get your terror steel. So you have to separate these things uh, quite a lot, which is grand. That's why we gave them this much space. Sort of expected that. Oh, you'll notice, by the way, I'm stepping up onto things without jumping. But you got my uh, Sojourner's Sash to work, which is a ball. It sits here with the hook and the backpack. It's a Sojourner's Sash. And you need a mana tablet with mana in it for this to work, which is a problem that I was having before. So now anything that is a full block high is stairs for me. And I am walking slightly faster. And also, if you wanted to uh, help, you can stand over here next to this. See, this is the my uh, XP going down. So this is drawing my XP and turning it into mana. But you see the flower fills up really quickly. I've now got only a scotch less than 38. Um, levels and not taken anymore so that's now full of mana and needs to be redistributed with that which is a pest but you know it's a good way of making use of some afk time for example what else have we got he did not say what he'd done but mostly it was what he usually does which is to make a bunch of stuff <laughs> in the farming area he did have to leave early as well so i wasn't really that much attention unfortunately um has actually made all of the project red gate type things so they have a place in storage now which is brilliant because i have Ooh, let me show you this so did i tell you this last time i made uh, an ender pouch i think i said this so this ender pouch is connected to the i replaced the dump chest with the ender chest that this is connected to so now if i don't want the thing i can just do that. um which is great because i have got this is full of these um so these can just come out of the system now and go and live in it I'm a bit um, salty about my bees because they'd all gone away. Uh, did I? Was that this week? Yeah, all my bees have decided that they don't need princesses anymore. And so 
It's just ground to a halt. Automation has stopped completely. I'm not sure really what to make about that. But there you go. Let's go and see. Because it was my understanding that pristine stock would always produce a uh, princess. It's possible that I accidentally deleted them. You see how... Well, we don't know they're all... No queen, yeah. We don't know that they're all pristine stock, but they should be, because the idea was that these ones were in pristine condition, all these forest drones. Pristine. Maybe the princess died and had no... If the queen dies and doesn't have room for the new princess, ah, then it might just get evaporated rather than... Maybe it's in the system. Maybe it's in here. Because everything should have gone in here, but this is full as well. So there was basically no room for the princesses when the queen died, which is a problem. Uh, probably should be avoiding those. These are kind of fun, but I, they take too long, so I get bored automated. I get bored waiting for them to do their job. Uh, we've still got this building to finish. It's, it's, you know, it's not us playing if the buildings aren't finished. Uh, Tristan has done basically a bunch of helpful stuff. Automated enrichment chamber. So fluids crystals um, are annoying in the sense that you have to go and find them. Well, certain quartz crystals you have to go and find. But I think you'll find that most recipes for Certus Quartz, you can also use Fluids. Certus. So if we say, here's a... So there's a Certus Quartz seed, but it turns into the pure Certus, right? And there's the same thing for Fluids. So if you have a look at the uses of Certus Quartz, you'll probably find, even this, <laughs> many of them don't work with pure Certus. Yeah, so a lot of these will work with charged certus, pure certus, and normal certus. So you can turn this here um, by a phytogenic insulator from a certus quartz seed all the way through to pure certus quartz crystal. There are multiple ways of doing this. The enrichment chamber will do it from this one. It doesn't matter. So these are just the different sizes of it as it grows. It always turns into the pure certus quartz, which is fine because you can use that in most cases where actual certus quartz is required. I've noticed there is no charged pure certus quartz. I'm hoping that's not a problem. Because uh, otherwise, you can charge certus quartz crystal, but you can't make them. Uh, and it's the same for fluids. So the fluids crystal, the fluid seed here, turn into pure fluids crystals, but there are actual fluids crystals as well. Which make what that does. Uh, but you can use fluids or pure fluids for that. So apparently, presumably that's what crys uh, crystals, Tristan's automated. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So I think what I'm going to do now, having shown off what Mike did, you'll have to go and watch Lawrence's video to fully understand what Lawrence did. Uh, and I've shown you that I have replaced all these things here, dug a bunch of holes, and I can't remember what I did on stream because I couldn't dig the holes. But I did something. Uh, <laughs> I made the ender tanks. Oh, so you wouldn't have known that. So yeah, I, ma I made the ender tank, which is cool because the ender tank's not so useful, you need two of them. The ender chest, so this and this are the same thing. And so when I open this, I open that. I'm sure I've told you this. Um, but that means that now wherever you are in any place, you can chuck stuff in the ender pouch and then it's just... So... That's fun. You get the same thing from the ender tank. Oh, and by the way, you can colour these in, right? So you've got one, two, three. Each of these can accept a die. And if you change the colour, then you change the inventory, and therefore like, this is now no longer connected to it. So if that was red, for example, that'd be red, white, white, and this white, white, white pouch would not open it. But I think you can bind the pouch with the thing you think. You do the same with the ender tanks, except that it contains fluid. I made two of them. You only needed one for the quest, but I made two of them. Simply because one is not useful. If any, if it's going to be useful, we might as well have two. Put this down here like this. Then get a bucket, for example. Of water. You can now craft water buckets, which is brilliant. Start these. And if I were to put this water bucket in here, it would also be in there. And I like this version, there's a mod, the new version on, um, put it on, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, I didn't realise. Um, in the new version on the latest 
pack. The Ender Tank kind of looks like a, you know, them speakers that you can get, which are like a concertina, and they, they're only a concertina, so you can clip them together because they're for travel, and they're a little USB speaker with them. Um, a Bluetooth speaker with a USB power, so that they're a powered speaker, uh, and they're pretty good. But this version of the Ender Tank with a little floaty thing inside it, looking like an automated uh, spray paint can. Uh, Shows you what the fluid is and how much, and it goes up and down, depending on how much is in it. And when you take one out of one, it, you know, reflects in the other. And it's got the cool sort of inside ender. Everyone does the ender effect, right? But in the new version, it's just a solid block. It's, it must be a, a limitation. I think they probably would have rather it looked like this, because not being able to see what's in it sounds like a mistake. So. Given that it's not a mistake, because it's obviously there, I'm guessing that it's a challenge and they, mm, they haven't finished. Anyway, that's really cool. I love that. So I'm going to go and um, start putting together the thing downstairs, and I'll bring you back whilst I'm doing it so that you can see what it should look like. And I'm going to do my little level best to explain it a little bit. Um, and hopefully it will make some sense to you, but I also need to look at how. So don't tell people that I got this off the internet because they stop respecting me. Definitely. All right, I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so the first thing you do is you lament the fact that you chose such a tall space and decide where you want the middle of the thing to go. So these, um, you'll notice like, just now that I had uh, dirt up there. That dirt was there so that I knew the widest part of the system. The widest part of the crafting tree is going to be seven blocks wide, I think. I think it might be nine actually, so I've made this exactly the right size. I may dig it a little bit further to give us a little bit of space around the outside, but that's not important. First thing you do is you bring your 32 channel cable down here and you surround it with eight channel cables and on those cables you put these cable anchors. And the reason for this is that you want to make sure when you surround it with interfaces, I believe is the first thing that you do. Um, no, the first thing you surround it with is the uh, assembly machines themselves. You want to make sure that the it's about the way the channels are used, basically, and the way channels work in AE, as you've known, they pass through um, blocks. So if you go up here, this is my uh, Sajun Sash, by the way, I don't need stairs anymore, you like, can clamber out. Um, these work, you know, this is using all eight channels, and there's eight interfaces on it, because the channel gets passed through the interfaces, but that gets a little bit complicated. As we've seen in the For Science episode, when you put a whole bunch of interfaces in a block, we wanted to use as many channels as we could, but you can only pass eight channels from where the cable joins through to any, um, you know, any item, any, any block on the system. Now, the way I believe that works is that actually means that this block here can only have eight channels passing through it. And this one can, and this one can, and this one can, right? But this one only has one channel. This one has, uh, this one has one channel passing through it. This one has two passing through it, and three, etc. So, if I was to put another one on here, this one could transmit it, and all these could transmit it. But this here one could not. And look at this cable, but that's not relevant. So, the arrangement of these cable anchors and cables downstairs ensures that the channels that reach each end are all eight channels away from the thing, and that you know is going to be done based on. A 3D structure, not a 2D structure. And there is a picture, as I promised, which I will try to remember to put on the video here to sort of it gives you an idea of how the channels pass through the interfaces, which is why we put those anchors on. Because if we do it the other way, if we don't allow the uh, if we allow the anchors to connect, words, if you take the anchors away and allow the cables to connect. The channels will run differently and it will try and make a shorter path and certain things won't be accessible as far as I understand it. So we need 12 anchors to uh, be like this. And then the next thing I'm going to do uh, is put a lot of things in my bag so that I can get as much stuff from upstairs as possible, bring it downstairs to show you how it works and hopefully they'll connect and it'll be Hopefully. Back in a minute. All right, so we're making the start, and you can see four of 32 channels are in use. That's because I put four interfaces down. Now, the trouble with picking these interfaces up is a full of damn recipes. So if it, I could only pick three full ones and one um, empty one up. Well, I could have picked more empty ones, of course, but there weren't any. So um, these used to have recipes in, now they don't. But if I put them back in, 
they will become back available to the system. So there's four channels in use because I've put four interfaces in. Let's go up here so you can have a bit of a bird's eye view of what's going on. So you can see the only connection point for any of these interfaces is the ends of those cables that we already put down. And you'll notice the only cable that's actually got anything going on. Is that right? This cable's using three and this cable's using one. So it's going to fit eight. And the way that you arrange it is you put another one on top here and another one on the bottom there. That is one, two, three, four, five. But then as you put these on here and here and here, you get a little bit more out of each one. And you have to make sure that it doesn't attach to this cable as well. So you do need some more cable anchors on the way up. But essentially the trick is to only allow it to connect at the ends of these four cables, which is 8, 16, 32, 60. 8, 16, 24, 32. That's how you add, not how you multiply. Um, which is all 32 cables. And then the magic of whoever figured this out, you know, the, the channels root around the structure so that each of these carries eight interfaces with, of cables, of, of, of channels with it. Uh, so that's currently using four. I'm going to go and get the rest. And we'll see how many we can fit on here before we need to just make more interfaces. So what I am realizing is they are one block wider than I remembered them. Well, not that I remembered them being, but I didn't read ahead. So they are nine blocks wide. And if I were to put, because at the end of the day, I'm going to put a molecular assembler there as well, right? Because I'm also going to be putting one there on the edge of, this will be an interface, but it will be, you know, there. Yeah, so they'll touch. So that's going to have to go a little bit further that way. Luckily, I have not put any more cabling here. By the way, you may be wondering, dense cable for one channel? Hey. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need dense cabling all this way. I'm only going to bring two channels down here, probably. But this is how much of the tree our current assembly setup used. And just to see that everything is OK, uh, let's put this into, you know, craftable mode. I can craft a pattern. I think here's all the craftable stuff, right? Including stuff that... Okay, some of this is in Carpenters and stuff upstairs, so not all of this is from down here. Some of this Lawrence's stuff, that's fine. But I know that the advanced crafting table is down here. And this one or this one. So what I tried to do was to... I tried to keep the patterns as close together as possible in some sort of sense, some sensible way. But I didn't do it too thoroughly because there is a interface, is what's called an, a, a, an interface terminal. And what that does is it shows you all the interfaces on the system. But in, to make that a little bit easier for yourself, you can actually hide this from the interface terminal. Now, I don't want to hide these ones, but I might want to hide all the other ones. Because the reason for that is that what you can do is you can go to the interface terminal and show you the nine slots it will basically show you these pattern slots for every single interface you've got in your system. Most of the interfaces in our system have got one pattern slot because they are doing something in a machine. Some of them have multiple pattern slots, but again, they're doing the thing in the machine, like Lawrence's runes, for example. Um, when you've got something like that, it's recognizable what it's for, right? So when they're in a big grid, each row is an interface. You can have a look at this entire tree of interfaces and sort of move the patterns around so that they make sense. And when you come to here and look in each interface, it's like, what's going on? You won't be able to because they'll be covered in assemblers, but that's not the point. Um, you know, although that is kind of the point, that's why you want the pattern interface, because otherwise you have to break an interface, get into there, see which one's got space and put it in. With that magical interface, you can go in, have a look at all of those and just, put the patterns where they belong. So I'm not worried too much right now about you know, doing it manually because we're going to do it from afar anyway. And that's how we're going to be able to get more patterns into the system once we've built this really fully. So you can see we need a lot more interfaces. We need a lot more assembly thingies, molecular assembly layers. Um, but that will be 32 times nine patterns available. The molecular assemblers themselves don't take any Channels, they do take power, but this is the same number as we already have in the system, so the system is not currently taking any more power. I put all the recipes back in, and it is all going down a single channel on here, all the way back upstairs. So that is the start, and we will continue it, and then we can make a second one. We could even make a third one, because this is P2. So 
let's not get ahead of us. But anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out Lawrence's video because Lawrence will have explained what he did way better than I ever could because I have no idea what he did. Um, and don't forget to come along at half past seven on Mondays to see us fight our way through this <laughs> insanely complicated mod pack a little bit more next week. But until then, thanks for watching and I will I'll see you.